Galatians, session six of Galatians chapter six in the book of Galatians, but today is Galatians six. So get yourself situated, Jennifer Johnson. So you have full tummies. I cannot believe the quantity of food that you girls brought. That's awesome. You've got plenty to take home. I'm thinking too, or maybe not. We'll see. Um, I want to, before I even begin to teach, I just want to tell you all that it has been my great privilege and great joy to have spent these weeks with you. It has just been delightful, and I hope that you have enjoyed it as well. But I just want to thank you for choosing to spend this time together, uh, doing this together, studying God's Word together. So I, I just wanted to begin there, and we're going to go now into our lesson, and we're going to start with, as I have been, with our quick review. So you will leave here today remembering everything you've learned thus far. It'll be cemented in your brains, right? I know. And if you forget, you can go watch the videos online and refresh your memory. Okay, girls, chapters one and two, this is where Paul established that his apostleship and the message that he teaches is of divine origin. This is important. If anybody ever wants to go toe-to-toe with you and say something to the effect of, well, that's just Paul, no, it isn't. It's of divine origin, and you're equipped to come back with that, all right? Okay, chapter three, we learned that even Ray. Even Abraham was declared righteous on the basis of his faith. Some people have pointed out to me, yeah, but it says that he was also declared righteous because he offered up his son Isaac. But do you know why he was able to do that? Because he believed God would fulfill the promise he had made through Isaac. So he was declared righteous on the basis of his faith. All right, chapter 4. We learned that we can be enslaved by the law, the legalism, but we are set free by the grace of the gospel. But not set free just to do whatever floats our boat, right? But we're set free to serve. And then last week, we were encouraged, as were the Galatians, to live by the Spirit so that we would have fruitful lives for the Lord. Excuse me. So we're going to begin this morning with the two divisions. I've been able pretty much to stick to that. I think it works best. The first one covers the first 10 verses of Galatians chapter 6. Pardon me just for two seconds. Okay, in this first division, Paul counsels the Galatians on Christian responsibilities. We do have responsibilities. He counsels them on Christian responsibilities. And before I even tell you what the second division is, I'm going to let you know that we're going to spend most of our time in the first division so that when I flip over to the second, you won't be thinking to yourself, we're going to be here all day. We aren't. Okay, second division is Paul cautions the Galatians to remember what counts. Cautions them to remember what counts. Okay, let's go ahead then. We're ready to get started and open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. I want to start this morning by asking this. Do any of you remember a television show that used to come on just a couple of years ago called Super Nanny? Does anybody watch that but me? Okay, I used to... I liked to watch Super Nanny. I'm sorry she's not on. I don't think anymore. You could probably find her. But for those of you who are not familiar with Super Nanny, the show kind of went something like this. Nanny Jo would temporarily move in to a household where everything was just in chaos. The kids were usually absolutely out of control. The parents usually were not on the same page on how to parent, and it was just chaos. Their, their lives were bedlam because their households were chaos. So the purpose of her temporarily moving in with that family was to help them bring harmony and order into their chaotic lives. That's what she was there for. So initially what she would do is to just observe. She just let them do their thing so that she could watch and determine exactly what the problems were that were causing all the chaos and how they could be rectified. And then after she made her observation, then she would give the family a set of guidelines to follow that would bring into their home the harmony and the order that they were all so hoping for. So that's super nanny. I thought about her when I came to Galatians chapter 6, thinking back really to chapter 5. Because in last week's lesson in chapter 5, you and I got an up-close and personal look at the chaos 
that was taking place in the Galatian churches. First of all, we saw mass confusion with the teaching, right? The Judaizers had come in and just upset the apple cart with their era. But worse than that, that era and the chaos that, it, that ensued also led to conflict between the believers in those churches. They were taking sides. I think this is what the gospel means. No, I think this is what it means. And it got real ugly to the point that Paul said to them, you are biting and devouring each other like wild animals. And if it doesn't stop, you're going to destroy each other. So, with that in mind, knowing that they were at a point where something had to give, Paul then, pretty much like Nanny Joe gave the churches of Galatia a set of guidelines to follow so that they might, once again, in this case, have harmony and order in their churches because it wasn't harmonious at all at that particular point. So the thing of it is, though, we have to go backwards a little bit to really put the whole set of guidelines in in perspective and in order. So we're going to start this morning really at the very end of chapter 5. So that's why I'm going backwards because that's really where Paul started. So the first point then in his guidelines that he's giving the church of Galatians is found in chapter 5 in verse 25. And in this verse he says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This particular point is foundational for every other point that he's going to make with them. Because if they don't get this one right, they will never be able to follow through with all the other guidelines or the other points that he's going to give to them. So this one is the starting point, and it lays the basis. So the first one is to keep in step with the Spirit. Okay, thinking back again to chapter 5, What does it look like when a person's in step with the Spirit? Well, it looks like the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It looks like that. And Paul is saying to them, this is where you need to start and this is where you need to stay. So point number one was to stay in step with the Spirit. Point number two in his guidelines is found in verse 26 in chapter 5, where he says to them, Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Now, what is he saying here? I think he's saying, point one, keep in step with the Spirit. Step two, do not yield to the sinful spirit. Don't do these things, because this is what you're doing now. Don't do these things. Keep in step with the Spirit. Don't yield to the sinful nature. And you have to think back to appreciate this as to how they were behaving. There was not a whole lot of love and kindness and patience going on, was there? No, they were ripping each other to shreds. And it had to stop. It had to stop. And that's the point, I think, that Paul is trying to make with them. You can't go on like this, or you won't be able to go on as a church any longer. So point number one, keep in step with the Spirit. Point number two, do not yield to the sinful nature. So we got two polar opposites here. Kind of sounds like a choice, doesn't it? And the reason it sounds like a choice is because that's exactly what it is. It was a choice they were going to have to make. You can go this way or you can go this way, but what you're doing now is not working. You can't continue like you are. But here's the thing, ladies, for them and for us, it sounds easier than it is sometimes to make that choice. Oh, today I think I'll yield to the Spirit. Well, today I'm in a bad mood. I'm just going to do what I've, I... I'm just going to go with it. I'm in a cranky mood, and I'm just going to be cranky. It's not always easy to do it right, is it? especially if we just look at it as a choice. And so I'm going to suggest to you that rather than just viewing this as a choice, that you and I view it as a discipline. We do other things in our lives by way of discipline, don't we? Like, for example, if you get a bad health report and the doctor says, this is off, off of your food chart anymore, and these are the things that you need to be eating. Well, 
we make that a discipline then, don't we? Usually out of necessity to eat healthier. It's a discipline. It's not just a choice. It's a discipline that we incorporate into our lives. Same could be said of exercise. It's not just a choice. It's a discipline. Or it could be something altogether different. Um, maybe you're shopping too much and you need to curb back your spending. Well, sometimes that too can be a discipline, right? So choosing to stay in step with the Spirit rather than yield to the sinful nature should be viewed not just as a choice, but as a discipline. And the thing about a discipline, I guess the good thing about a discipline is, although it may not be easy at the beginning, that the more we do it, the more natural it becomes. And the more natural it becomes, then the easier it is to do it. It just becomes a part of who we are and what we do. And I think that maybe is the way we should look at it. All right. So the remaining uh, guidelines he has to give them are found in chapter 6. So we're actually moving to the chapter of the day out of chapter 5. And the first three additional points that he gives are found in verses 1 through 5. So I'm going to begin by reading those five verses to you. Starting in verse 1, Paul writes, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. So the, the next point, which would be point number three in the set of guidelines, is that we are to restore someone who has fallen. He says that he describes this saying someone who's caught in a sin, which indicates to us that this is not somebody who's living in sin, but someone who has committed a sin. In other words, it's not a lifestyle, but it's a lapse. So we need to think of it that way. Um, knowing this will help a little bit, when you put it in the original language, it would be the same kind of phrase that would be used to describe a bird that gets caught in a trap. It's not premeditated, it's not deliberate, but it happened. It's real, but it's not a lifestyle, it's a lapse. So Paul is saying to them, if you have someone like that in your midst, and with all the stuff going on that was bad in the churches at that time, surely there was more than one person who was lapsing from time to time because they were pretty much operating out of the sinful nature. He said, this person is not to be condemned. They are not to be treated like a castaway, but they are to be restored. And the people that, uh, well, I'm going to move back to that. And the restored, the word here, restored, I, I really like this, helps us to understand better, I think, wh where he was coming from because the word in the original language, the word restored in the Greek, actually carries with it the idea, it's the same word they would use for mending a broken or a ripped fishing net or medically setting a broken bone. So you need to restore them, he says, in the same way you would mend a net or set a bone which carries with it the idea of putting the thing back just like it was before. So in the end, when you restore this person, when you mend that net, when you set that leg, it's as good as new. It's just like it was before. Then here's where I was getting ahead of myself. The people who are to take on this mission should be those who are spiritual. Well, who is that? Well, I think there's a couple of things we can... Uh, we can uh, draw from to determine who the spiritual people in the church would have been. And first of all, I think it would have been the people who were the most mature in the faith, those who had at least some kind of uh, history of walking with the Lord, not somebody who was brand new, a novice to the faith. Um, in part, this would be because someone who's walked with God longer is more likely to have godly wisdom and godly discernment. And that's important because what he doesn't tell us here is how to go about restoring this person. We're told to do it, but there's no how-to. There's no steps one, two, three, and then they're restored. 
So, because every person in every situation would be different, somebody who was mature enough in the faith to have godly wisdom and discernment would have to determine themselves how you go about restoring this particular person. It also, I think, would give uh, more credibility to the person on mission here if they themselves had had a walk with the Lord that had a little history and longevity to it. You might, if you were the fallen person, think, well, this guy probably knows what he's talking about or this girl knows because she's, she's been a believer for a really long time and I've watched her life. I know it's the real deal. I trust what she's saying to me. So credibility would also be a factor. I think also anyone who's really walked with the Lord for a while has probably themselves lapsed somewhere along the way and experienced for themselves God's grace. And who better, ladies, to bestow grace than someone who's experienced grace. So a spiritual person would be who you want to send. A spiritual person also is probably the one whose life evidences the fruit of the Spirit, right? Paul said, go to them and restore them gently. Well, what are one of the things in that list? Gentleness. So this spiritual person would be a person who was showing by the life they lived that they, they were um, carriers, portrayers of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, Paul particularly, I believe, specified that it must be a person who was spiritual to carry out this role because he knew that if some of these legalists got their hands on this person, rather than restoring them, they would probably crush them. Because the legalists were lawmen, and there was no mercy with a lawman. Um, how many of you here have heard at some point in your life the story of the woman caught in adultery from John chapter 5? Most of you. Those of you who have not, let me just give you the, the short version of it. One day Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, which was very public, and the religious leaders who did not like him a little bit and were always trying to trip him up, drug before him publicly with all the people standing there listening to Jesus' teaching, a woman who they said had been caught in the very act of adultery. So they're standing there with stones in their hands. And they say to Jesus, the law says an adulteress should be stoned. What do you say? They were trying to trip him and trap him. Jesus said, as he wrote in the dirt, and I would love to know what he wrote, we don't know. You're right. That is what the law says. So here's what I say. Let whoever among you is without sin, let him be the first one to throw a stone. And they begin to drop those stones one by one, beginning with the eldest. See, they had come there as legalists, ready to stone that woman to death just to make a point. And Paul said, that's not the kind of person we want you to send to someone who's had a lapse, someone who's committed a sin. You send someone who's spiritual to do that job, not a legalist. So he set that in place. But the second part of this verse has something else important to say. And in the second part of that same verse, he says, But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. In other words, even those of you who are spiritual, do not go to this person, even in your heart of hearts, with an a attitude of self-righteousness. And well, I'm going to go to this poor brother who tripped up and fell. Now, I, on the other hand, would never do that, but I'm going to help him because he did. He said, beware that you do that. You better be careful because we all have feet of clay, which means that any one of us has still the capacity in us to sin, even though we are born-again believers. So he's saying you go in a right attitude to restore them gently, but also to be mindful of the fact there, but for the grace of God, perhaps go you. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> sorry, girls, <clears throat> he's told them to stay in step with the Spirit, to refuse to yield to the sinful nature, 
and to restore those who have fallen. Which brings us to point number four, which we find in chapter 6 and verse 2. In this one, he says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, the word for burden here in the Greek is the word baros, B-A-R-O-S. And it means a, a really weighty burden, burden, something that's really heavy and would be difficult for one person to carry on their own. Um, in Greek writings or secular writings, they would often use this word when they were describing tremendous grief or misery of someone. So it, it's intended to carry a, a sense of weightiness. Um, some people think, some scholars think, that when he, when he uses this word and he says in context with carrying a person, another person's burden, that he's really referring back to the person who's lapsed into sin. In other words, they're so weighted down with their sin, they need you to come alongside of them and help them bear that burden, be their encourager, you know, be their cheerleader. But others believe, and I, I tend to go with the second opinion, that this really goes much further than that. Because there are all kinds of burdens in life that people are carrying far beyond guilt and shame. And just as some examples that, I, that came into my own head, I thought of some things, of situations that I actually know of. Um, somebody who's been through a prolonged illness can get to a point where it just becomes heavy to bear. You just think, how much longer can this go on? How much longer can I bear this? Or on the, the other side of that coin... What about the caretaker for that person who's experiencing a prolonged illness or any other kind of problem where somebody has to be there hands-on all the time? I don't know how many of you in this room have ever been a caretaker where you just had to be there physically for somebody else physically. I've done that twice in my life. And I can tell you it can be a weighty task. You do it because it needs to be done. And you don't fuss about it, but it can get to be weighty sometimes. That's an example of something that can be heavy and overwhelming. Or what about this one? What about ongoing or even maybe just a crisis situation of a financial problem that just hits you broadside? That can be heavy, heavy, heavy. Do you all realize that more marriages end over financial strain than any other reason? That can be a heavy, heavy burden to bear. Or, or what about this one? What about loneliness? What about a prolonged loneliness? I think the elderly in particular fall prey to this very often because they're cut off. They're no longer in the workforce. A lot of them no longer drive or have access to transportation. And they're just on their own. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And it gets to be overwhelming. Well, here's the sad truth. When we think about people in those situations, none of us, none of us are going to be able to carry that kind of burden for everybody that we know that's hurting like that. I know several people, and you probably do too, we can't carry that burden for everybody we know. We can't. But can we not do something to help someone along the way? We can do that, can't we? We can help out a little bit. Let's think about the person who's in financial straits. You might not be able to pay their mortgage, but what about taking them a bag of groceries? I bet you could do that. Or what about someone who's a caretaker? And just like their patient is stuck in the house, so are they, day in and day out, with all these responsibilities, all these things to shoulder. Everything falls to them. How about this? Could you go sit with their, their spouse or their child or their mother or whatever for an afternoon so she could get out and maybe get her hair done? Or for goodness sakes, just make a trip to the grocery store. You could do that, couldn't you? I could do that, couldn't I? Or what about the elderly who are lonely? 
And my mother lives in a retirement community. And I can't tell you how many times some of those other people who see me coming there all the time, those other elderly people have said to me, oh, your mom's so lucky that you come to visit her. My kids never come. They're lonely. What about a phone call? What about a visit to someone who's experiencing that kind of prolonged loneliness? I want to tell you a story that, that kind of falls under that particular heading, so to speak. Um, I know of a young mother, a young mom, who used to, uh, in the afternoons, have to run her kids to different things, or, or that was just the time of day when she could finally get out to run her errands. And she started noticing that not just in her neighborhood, but in her area, she saw several of the older ladies that lived in those houses, she, just because of the time of day, go to their mailboxes. It was the time of day, apparently, when the mail was delivered. And open those little boxes and stick their heads in and then close them and walk back into their homes empty-handed. And she said, I thought to myself, how sad is that? They're just wanting to get something from somebody, but nobody's sending them anything. And so you know what she did? She went to her church and asked if she might have the names and contact information for all the elderly widows that she knew were shut-ins, that didn't even come to church anymore, but that lived in that area, because she was going to go visit them. And so the church gave her that information, because they were church members of her church. So she called them and said, hey, I'm so-and-so from our church. If it would be okay with you, I'd like to come visit. A couple turned her down, just because they were afraid of people anymore. They were that much shut in. But most of them were delighted to have her visit. And so, on a fairly regular visit, uh, air on a basis, she would, she would visit these different ladies, and she befriended them, and they, they finally had somebody to talk to. And she said they would just talk her ears off about, you know, what it was like when they grew up and what it was like when they were a young mom, and just, oh, no, 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 no. They finally had somebody to be a sounding board. Some of them even confided in her some of the struggles they've had in their, they had had in their lives. And so she was able to encourage them, not only from things that had happened in the past, but in their present situations. But that wasn't all she did. Guess what else she did? She sent those ladies cards in the mail so that when they went to their mailboxes, they would no longer walk back to their houses empty-handed. And when one of those elderly ladies finally passed away, this young mom got a phone call from the daughter of that elderly lady. And she said, I just wanted to let you know that I found the cards that you sent my mom because she saved every one of them. And she said, I just wanted to thank you for being her friend. So we can't do everything for everybody, but we can do some things for somebody. So just please, let's all just try to be mindful of that, right? He also said in verse 2 that when you do this, when you do this for somebody, you fulfill the law of Christ. <clears throat> but what's the law of Christ? What is that? He didn't spell it out for us. Well, there were a lot of different opinions I came across that, about what the law of Christ actually is. But the one I think is probably most fitting is found in John 13 and verse 34, where Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. We're to love each other the way Jesus loved. And how was that? It was sacrificial. And it was with the heart of a servant. So to me, this is, this is the law of Christ. And when we bear those burdens for and with somebody else, we fulfill that law. So that was the fourth one, to bear one another's burdens. The fifth one then, found in verses 3 through 5, uh, are to examine ourselves. And I want to reread those verses to you, 3 through 5, once again, so it'll be fresh in your mind. He says, If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Now, when he says, If anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he's not saying that anybody is a nobody. But what he is saying is, just check yourself to make sure you don't have an inflated opinion of who you are. That's pretty much what that one means. Uh, he's really speaking here, I think, of pride. 
And I came across several things as I was studying about pride, and I thought I would just share some of it with you. One commentator had this to say about pride. He said, few things are more deceptive than pride, for pride blinds us, and it blinds us to these things. First of all, to the freely given gifts and favors of God. If we think we're all in all and all, all that, then we miss the things that God has given us that we have. He said, pride blinds us to our own sin and failings. Pride also blinds us to the good that's in others. And finally, pride blinds us to the foolishness of being self-centered. So in context, I believe what he's saying here is if we are self-focused, if we think more of ourselves than we ought to, then we are not going to be other-focused. If we're self-focused, we will not be other-focused. And if we're not other-focused, we're not even going to see the burden somebody else is carrying, much less be motivated to help them with it. He's saying, so check yourself that you don't have an inflated opinion of yourself. And then the second part of that self-examination, he says this, but if you want to take pride in something, then take pride in what God has done through you rather than comparing yourself to somebody else. You know, God has given each one of us different talents and different gifts and different opportunities. So it's really baseless, isn't it, to compare ourselves to anybody else. We're different people. God's equipped us differently. He's called us to different things. So he's saying, if you want to take pride in something, don't compare yourself to somebody else, but instead take pride in what God has done through you. But here's the thing about it. When you do that, when you start to take pride in what God has done through you, immediately you realize, oh, God did that through me. I didn't do that myself. God did that through me. So it's God who gets the glory and not you and not me. Paul had this to say in Romans 15, in verses 17 and 18. Paul said, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. So where did the glory go? To Jesus in Paul's service. He went on to say, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. So who got the glory for what God did through Paul? Jesus did. The Lord did. Not he himself. And then the third part of this self-examination is found in verse 5 where he says, and each one should carry his own load. Now, when you read that initially, doesn't that sound like, wait a minute, is that not a contradiction? Didn't you just say that we should carry each other's loads? And now you're telling us to carry our own load? What? Well, the difference is to be found in the original meaning of the words in the Greek. I've already shared with you that the first word, the baros word in the Greek, is talking about a heavy, weighty load that would be very difficult for someone to bear alone. But when he tells us to carry our own load, the word is different. The word, the Greek word there, I'm going to spell it for you, is P-H-O-R-T-I-O-N. So it would be pronounced portion. P-H-O-R-T-I-O-N. And it speaks of a lighter kind of load. It's, it's, it's the same word that would be used to describe the backpack that soldiers carry as they go marching off to war. So it's not a load they can't carry on their own. They certainly can. They certainly do. It's also the same word that Jesus used when he said, Come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, for my yoke is easy and my Fortos, for shun, is light. So it's that same, it's a lighter load. And the idea here is that this lighter load that falls on our shoulders comes in the form of responsibilities that are ours to bear and that no one else really can bear for us. They're on us and they're for us to carry. Some examples I thought of that were, first of all, like a hardship that comes into your life. It's a hardship on you and you're responsible to bear it. And the picture I had immediately was of my grandparents when I was a little girl. When I was very young, one of my grandfathers had a stroke, and he couldn't work anymore. And that meant that my grandmother, who had been a housewife her entire life, had to get a job 
She had to become the breadwinner. Now, her adult children helped her as they could, but they had young families, and they could only do so much. So it was really on her to support that family, and she did. Fortunately for her and for them, she was a very skilled seamstress, and so she went to work for a hospital. Back in those days, did you even know this used to happen? The hospi- you, they didn't have the uniform shops like we have now, so the hospitals supplied the nurses and doctors with those white uniforms that they wore. And the seamstresses that worked there made those uniforms. They also made the curtains that went around the operating tables. My grandmother did that kind of work. So she was fortunate that she had that skill. But still, it turned their world upside down because she had to go to work and be the breadwinner. And not only did she have that on her shoulders, but my grandfather, who was not happy that he'd had a stroke, he, had some, he was crippled from it. He still had his mental faculties, but he couldn't walk anymore, was, would often have periods of depression. So not only did she have all the taking care of everybody's everything on her, she also had to deal with a husband that was depressed frequently. But you know what? I never, ever heard her complain or saw even a speck, even a sign of bitterness from her. That was her load to bear to bear, and she did. She, she bore it well. She bore it very well. So sometimes it can be a hardship. Uh, other times it can be like a personal sacrifice that's just on you. It's required of you, and you alone must bear it. You know who I thought of when this idea came to my mind? I thought about our ministers and our teachers and our staff here. We are so abundantly blessed with the people that serve us here, and they do serve us. But sometimes they do it at great cost to their own personal lives. We are not privy to everything that goes on behind the scenes in their lives. But there are many times when they sacrificially serve us. It's not just showing up on Sunday morning by any stretch of the imagination. But they bear that load because it goes with their calling. And they're responsible to bear it. And so they do it. And they do it without complaint or bitterness. It's their, it's their load to carry. Or another one might be an illness. An illness. Um, when we're sick, nobody else can take that from us. They can't bear that for us. We have to carry that ourselves, don't we? I don't know, but I would guess that a number of people in this room probably have either experienced firsthand or through a spouse or a child or a friend, somebody, cancer in their lifetime because it's so prevalent in our world today. Some of you sitting in here have been that person. And, and people could help you, kind of, along the way, but nobody else could go through your chemo for you, could they? You had to do that. Nobody else could go through those surgeries for you, could they? You had to do that yourself. So there are some loads that we must carry ourselves. And I don't know what your loads are. I know what mine are, but I don't know what yours are. But I tell you what else I do know. I do know that as born-again believers, the Holy Spirit of God indwells us. And if the Holy Spirit of God indwells us, then although our load might be ours alone to bear, to carry, we are not alone in it because God, God, The Holy Spirit, who was in us, is also in that situation with us. So it might be ours to bear, but we do not bear it absolutely alone. God is in it with us. And that brings us then, ladies, to our last two points in the guidelines. And these are found in verses 6 through 10. So I'm going to read those verses to you quickly. Anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those to the household of faith. So the sixth 
point in the guidelines, verse number six, is that anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with their teachers. Almost every scholar was of the opinion that this was speaking of financial support of people who are in full-time ministry. And I absolutely would agree that that's where, what this is meaning. At, for one thing, it seems obvious just in the reading of it, but also because there are other scriptures that really share the same idea. Paul wrote in Corinthians, If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? And the obvious answer is no. And so this is the idea here that we should financially support those who are in full-time ministry. But see, for the Galatians, this would have been a novel idea because um, under Judaism, and remember there's all these Jewish converts in there as well, the priests were paid through temple taxes and offerings and their portion of offerings that the people brought. So that was covered. And even the pagans, which most of the Galatians had formerly been, paid fees and when they made vows at their temples. So that took care of their pagan priest. But the idea of voluntarily giving of your, your money to support those in ministry was a new idea. But Paul says this is the right thing to do. And it was the right thing for him to point out to them because Paul also knew that these people in particular were going to need godly, strong leadership going forward if they should get their act together. But without financial support, nobody would be able to do that. So Paul set this in place as something they should do. But he followed this with a word of warning, which is found in verses 7 and 8, where he says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So some people, again, are thinking that this is relating to sowing sparingly or being chintzy when you give to support the pastors. But most think that it's broader than that. And I tend to go with the it's broader than that idea. Because it seems like Paul here is reminding them not only that there's a choice to be made to stay in step with the Spirit or yield to the sinful nature, but that whatever direction you choose, there will be consequences, and oftentimes lasting consequences. I think he probably used this particular illustration because everybody understood that you reap what you sow if you're a farmer. If you sow to get a wheat crop, you sow for wheat, you get wheat. If you sow to get oats, you get oats. So it was an illustration that they could understand. But the thing about sowing and reaping is that it takes time. You don't plant a seed one day and get a crop the very next day. It takes time between the sowing and the reaping. So because of this, there were some people who were of the mentality that if they sowed to the sinful nature, which clearly a number of them were doing, and nothing happened, yep, they got away with it, right? You know, the sky didn't fall, they didn't get struck by lightning, they got away with it. But Paul's point here is that, no, you didn't. Just because it takes time, eventually, whatever you sowed is going to pop up, and there will be consequences. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote this, and I, I liked it, made me smile. He says, sooner or later in life, we all sit down to a banquet of consequences. We may think we got away with it, but not so fast, because eventually it will come. But here's the flip side of that. There were others, the godly, those who were staying in step with the Spirit, who were also sowing to the Spirit. But like the ungodly, they didn't see any quick results either. And they grew discouraged. They grew weary with well-doing. And he's saying, don't do that either. Don't do that either. Just keep on, keep on doing good. I thought about those long-term consequences, and I'm going to tell this to you quickly because I'm, I want to wrap up here in just a few minutes. I'm going a little bit long, I'm afraid. But I've told you all before about the grandmother that poured into me when I was a little girl. She took me on all her outings with her church lady friends. I sat with her in church. I watched her read her Bible. I listened to her pray out loud. She poured into me. And I couldn't help but think, and I have to take time to say this to you, she lived in a small world. She had a small little neighborhood and a small little church, and she did what she could for the Lord, and she did it with gusto. But while she was doing all that, she was pouring into me. 
And every time I stand before you girls, you know what I think? You are my grandmother's harvest. She planted that seed in me, and here you are. She didn't live to see it, obviously. It took a long time, but the seed she planted did reap a harvest. So don't grow weary in well-doing, Paul's saying. And that brings us to the last of the, the points in the guideline, which is found in verse 10, number 7, to do good, to do good. Let us do good to all people, he says, but especially those who belong to the family of believers. Uh, one, one commentator said this, is as in a home, you feed your family first, and then you take care of the neighbors. So it's kind of that same idea. And then Paul's final words, and I'm going to read this to you, verses 11 through 18, are these. He says, see what large letters I use as I write to you in my own hand. Now, this is because he was trying to, probably the large letters was to punctuate all the things he'd been saying. But in those days, especially with a long letter, you didn't write it yourself. You dictated it to a secretary. And no doubt that's what Paul did because this is a really long letter. But oftentimes at the end of his letters, he himself would sign off. So it made the letter more personal, but it also authenticated the fact that it really was from him. So he says, see what large letters I use. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. But the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that, that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Then finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And his final words, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So what is he saying to them wrapping up? He's saying to them, first of all, those Judaizers, those guys, I'm telling you one last time. They pretend they have this great zeal for you. They do not. They simply want a following so that they can boast in your flesh and so that they can avoid the persecution of the cross. Because should the Judaizers have taught the truth, like everybody else who went solely with the Lord Jesus and the cross of Christ for salvation, they themselves would have been persecuted. They really wanted it both ways. I think they recognized mentally Jesus was the Messiah, but they weren't willing to go all the way with him because that would mean persecution for them personally. So he's warning them of that. And then he says, listen to me one more time here. Circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. God is not looking for the outward ritual. He's looking for a right heart. He's not looking on the outside. He's looking on the inside. He's not interested in circumcision. He's interested in you being a new creation. And the only way you can ever become a new creation is to be in Christ through faith. And then he closes his letter by wishing them grace, which is how he began and how fitting that he would do that. Since really, if you could say there's a thread that goes through these six chapters, it would be that thread of grace. It would be that thread of grace. So it was the theme of the entire letter, and it's certainly been the theme of our study this time as well. So grace, grace, God's grace. But having said that, let me just give you one more word as well. That although we are saved by grace, there are things as Christians that we're instructed to do. It's not just like, okay, well, I'm saved, got my ticket punched to heaven, I'm out of here, I'm doing my thing. There are things we're to do that the Scripture, as believers, instructs us to do. And I'm just going to run over just a couple, just a few for you. One of them, I think, is church membership. We're told to gather together and not to forsake that. We do that today through church membership to make sure we're a solid body together. We're told to do that. We need each other. Also, baptism. Baptism does not save you. But when Jesus sent the disciples out with the Great Commission, he said, you teach them and baptize them. Why? Because it's a public declaration that I identify with and I belong to, I stand for. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. So as believers, we are to be baptized. Or how about this one? I love this one. The observation of the Lord's Supper. He didn't just say, okay, this was nice, wasn't it? Did you guys enjoy that? He said, do this as often as you shall in remembrance of me. You remember, you remind yourself, you remind your children of what I did for you on that cross. You do this in remembrance of me. So we're to do that, which we do monthly here at First Redeemer, and I'm so grateful for that. We're to share our faith with those who don't know the Lord Jesus, which, ladies, is the mass majority. Outside these walls, most of the people you're going to encounter do not know Jesus. They do not, but you do. As God gives you opportunity, share your faith. As you go, share your faith with others. And then how about this one from today's lesson? Help each other bear those heavy burdens. Help each other when we're overwhelmed with the things that come upon us in life that we just can barely shoulder anymore on our own. Bear one another's burdens. And that's just a few. None of those things save us. They don't but we're to do them as believers. We don't do them to be saved. We do these things because we are saved. But salvation, salvation is by grace. And it's by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. And that, ladies, is the gospel truth. And it's a wrap. Love you, girls.